Okay, hello everyone. So we're talking about uh, some recent exciting work on parallel minimum cuts. Uh, I'm Daniel, and this is joint work with my advisor, Guy Blalock. So you're probably familiar with the minimum cut problem, but just to double check and be sure, the minimum cut problem uh, says we're given a weighted undirected graph, and we'd essentially like to divide the vertices up into two halves, right, two non-empty subsets, such that we want to minimize the total weight of the edges that cross from one of the halves into the other half. And this is one of the classic, most well-studied problems uh, in graph theory uh, with algorithms going back many, many years. So the very first algorithms for minimum cut were all based on minimum ST cuts, which in turn can be solved by a maximum flows. So an ST cut is, is a minimum cut where you have two special vertices S and T, and you require that S and T be in different parts of the cut. And we know that this is solvable via max flows from our favorite theorem from network flows. And so this gives us one easy option to solve the so-called global min cut problem, which is you know, try every option for S and T and pick the best one. And over the years, more algorithms along this line were developed to you know, essentially try and reduce the number of max flow computations necessary to compute a minimum cut. Uh, then Karga came along with a technique not based on maximum flows. He instead came up with a new technique called contraction. At its core, it's super simple. Uh, contracting an edge just means to take an edge, look at its two endpoints and smoosh them together and make them one vertex. And so the simplest contraction algorithm is essentially you just take your edges in a random order. So you pick one edge at a time, you contract that edge, you join the vertices at its endpoints, and you keep going until you're left with just two vertices. And these two vertices correspond to a cut, right? All the vertices that have been smooshed into one and all the vertices that have been smooshed into the other, and the edges between them are the edges that cross the cut. So this clearly gives us a cut, but you know how good of a cut? Well. Karga shows that with probability at least one on n squared, this will actually give you the minimum cut. And therefore, if you just repeat this process a bunch of times, say n squared log n times, with high probability, you will encounter. And again, there's various extensions to this technique to reduce the number of trials you have to do that involve various optimizations. Um, but that's the main idea. And there's a useful conceptual idea that pops up here as well, which is the distinction between weighted and unweighted graphs. Uh, it's useful often in analysis to consider a weight W edge and pretend that it's actually W unweighted edges. Now, of course, you don't actually do this in the implementation of the algorithm because this would blow up the size of your graph, but this turns out to be a handy conceptual trick for the analysis, where if you have to analyze your algorithm, you can often show, you know, a correspondence between the two ways of looking at it, and this can help. The algorithm doesn't actually use the weights at all. Um, well, the algorithm will have to use the weights, but it's just it's just often that the analysis. Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one doesn't. So I left out a small detail. So when you permute the edges of your graph, uh, your permutation is biased by the weights. And one way to think about it using this conceptual idea is imagine you take a W weight edge and turn it into W unit weight edges, and then you commute all of those unit weight edges. Um, your, the, the final position of an edge will be where its first occurrence is. Therefore, a higher weight edge is more likely to end up at the front. So you would never actually you know, implement that, but that way of thinking about it often helps with the analysis. You can often show that it's equivalent to doing some weighted version and that this, this idea of treating it as unweighted helps the analysis without actually implementing the splitting process. Okay, so after contraction-based algorithms, Karga came along yet again with a completely new technique based on tree packings and so-called so two respecting cuts. So we say that a cut of G two respects some spanning tree of G if at most two edges of the tree cross the cut. So this leads you to a different way of thinking about the problem now, where if you, if you have a spanning tree and you want to find a two respecting cut, you're essentially just trying to pick two edges of the tree and induce a cut based on those two edges. 
And Kaga showed that uh, there's a process that will generate you a handy little set of log n spanning trees, such that with high probability, the minimum cut two respects at least one of them, which leads to a natural algorithm. You find these log n trees, you then find the two respecting, minimum two respecting cut for each of them. And with high probability, the best of those is indeed the minimum cut of your whole graph. So Kaga gave an m log squared n time sequential algorithm, as well as an n squared log n work parallel algorithm uh, for minimum cut using this two respecting cut idea. And what's really amazing about these algorithms is that these were the best, both sequential and parallel algorithms for almost 20 years. So these two algorithms that came from the same technique were unbeaten for almost 20 years in both sequential and the parallel world. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So you find a, so you take a tree and you say, maybe you're going to get this later, I guess. So you say, if you want to, you want to check if the cuts that it is too respecting, and then try all of those and see which one is the minimal one, and then do that for the next tree, and do that for the next tree. Is that Essentially, yeah. Yeah, and the, the trick comes in doing that efficiently, because if you sort of just do it too brute forcey, of course, you do a lot of work. Uh, the trick comes in doing it efficiently, and yeah, that's what most of the talk is about. Yes. Yeah, so if you, if you wanted to do something very simple, yeah, and you're willing to spend a lot of work, you could just try uh, for each tree, for each pair of edges, try forming a cut with those edges and just see what the, see what the cut looks like. And so yeah, a lot of the fancy work involves doing that much more efficiently. So, like I said, these were the best algorithms for almost 20 years, but recently uh, a whole lot of work has pushed this forward. So compared to Karga's sequential algorithm, which is uh, m log cubed n time, uh, Geisman and Gianni Nazi, they improved Karga's parallel algorithm recently in SPA 2018, and they gave an m log to the 4n work, but log cubed n depth parallel algorithm. So this is just a single log factor slower than Karga's sequential algorithm, but unlike Karga's sequential algorithm, it's highly parallel. And it's much more work efficient than Kaga's parallel algorithm for sparse graphs, at least. And then just a couple of years later in iCalp 2020, uh, Garachowski et al, they improved Kaga's sequential algorithm, bringing it down to just m log squared n time. But note that all throughout the history of the problem here, there's always been a gap between the fastest parallel algorithm and the fastest sequential algorithm. That is, we've never had a parallel algorithm we could call work efficient, which means that it does no more work in total uh, than the best known sequential algorithm. So our contribution is precisely closing that gap. So we come up with a parallel algorithm for the cut problem, and its total work <coughs> is m log squared n, uh, and it has log cubed n depth. So it matches the work of the best known sequential algorithm while also being highly parallel. And this algorithm combines a ton of ideas. It uses some of the ideas from Garachowski et al. and from Geisman and Gianni Nazi. And it combines it with a bunch of new tools that we derive. And this allows us to bridge the gap between the two and get the best of both worlds. So as an overview of, uh, of how we do it and what we'll talk about today, the first thing we come up with is a very handy tool. This is a tool for evaluating batches of dynamic tree operations all at once in parallel. So what I mean by that is, say you have a dynamic tree, maybe it supports adding weight to every edge on a path or adding weight to everything in a subtree or querying for the minimum or maximum weight on a path, or the minimum or maximum or sum of weights in a subtree, whatever you want. And then let's say you give me a sequence of these operations. My goal is to evaluate the answer to all the queries as if you'd executed them sequentially, except 
all, all at once in parallel, because of course doing them sequentially would well not be a very parallel algorithm. So our goal is to simulate this offline sequence of dynamic tree operations very quickly in parallel. So we then show that this tool has many useful applications to Karga's algorithm and the recent improvements to it, because if you look at the, the details of those algorithms, they heavily involve doing tons of operations on dynamic trees. And so this tool turns out to be very useful for both speeding them up and parallelizing them. And lastly, we use rake compressed trees, RC trees, and we show that this can help us parallelize some of the harder to parallelize pieces of uh, Garachowski et al's recent m log squared n algorithm. So that's where we're going today. Any questions so far before we this get into it? Rather far fetched <laughs> approach. Like, why would you think you could parallelize, you know, linking, cutting trees, and doing queries, and all these? Because you change the tree dramatically, right? Yeah. So in, in, in this case, um, we don't actually need links and cuts. We only need the, the weight operations. So adding weight, deleting weight, querying for the weight. We don't actually do structural updates. Oh, okay. That being said, I'm not convinced we can't. I'm pretty sure if we put a bit more work into it, we might be able to do structural updates too. Uh, but we, ha we haven't needed to. Uh, but I'm not convinced that that's too hard either. So that could still work. So yeah. The model of parallelism here is just like the guide model for what the tree does. Yes, I believe that's my next slide. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll explain that in excellent excellent question, perfectly <laughs> preempted. Um, so oh yeah, we're, we're working in the the work depth model, uh, also known as the work span model. So work is just the total number of instructions that your algorithm performs. You can think of that equivalently as the time it would take if you just ran it sequentially without any parallelism. And depth then is the opposite. Depth is the longest chain of sequentially dependent instructions. If you imagine you know, a DAG for your, the instructions in your computation. Equivalently, you can think of depth as being you know, the opposite of work. It's the runtime if you had infinitely many processes available to you. So depth is like the best possible runtime if you have as much parallelism available as you could ever want. And work is just the total runtime if you don't have any parallelism. And uh, this is you know, a very simple way to analyze parallel algorithms. Uh, you know, it's easy to translate between more concrete uh, models like the binary forking model or the classic PRAM. These things can all simulate each other uh, work efficiently, meaning no loss of work, at most like a log n factor difference in the uh, in the depth if you want to translate between these models. So this is like the the classic, or not classic, but maybe the modern model for talking about uh, parallel algorithms. Okay. Um, in the paper, yes. In the talk, no. <laughs> so uh, we we do in the paper, but I won't be going into that level of fine detail here. Feel free to ask about it if you if you want. Although a lot of them, a lot of it is copious details that aren't very particularly interesting, trying to cut log factors off depth. Okay, so a handy tool that we're going to need for this work is rate compressed trees. So um, I don't have time to tell you about the full details of rate compressed trees, but it's enough to know that a rate compressed tree essentially encodes a recursive clustering of your tree. So at the bottom, we have vertices and edges. Uh, note importantly that edges are sort of their own independent things. That is, an edge can be in a cluster, while it's the vertex it's adjacent to could be in a different cluster for now. So edges are treated as like their own independent entities, and this is important because edges are actually the thing we care about more when talking about cuts. So at the bottom we have like every vertex and every edge is its own singleton cluster. Right? They have no friends yet, and you know we can look at clustering things together. So joining some vertices and edges to their neighbors to form bigger clusters and so on, going up, forming bigger clusters from our smaller clusters, going up and up like this until we hit uh, like the root cluster that contains everything. Right. Yes. So the, the things on the side, are those like clusters? 
yeah, so each sort of different color here represents like a layer of clusters. So, so it's the, it's the, the dark gray one. So, so this dark gray one, for example, contains one edge and one vertex. Yeah, and then like this guy has two edges and a vertex. This this would be called we call this a binary cluster because it has two boundary vertices. This would be a a unary cluster because it has one boundary vertex. Uh, but those details are not. You don't need to remember that terminology. But yeah, uh, so yeah, it's good. It's important to observe, as I said before. You can have an edge in a cluster without necessarily having the neighboring vertex in that same cluster yet. I mean, they'll, they'll get joined eventually higher up in the clustering, but. Not for rate compressed trees, yeah. So for rate compressed trees, we always get um, at most like binary. So at most two vertices on the boundaries. And we, we get this by, you know, the standard restriction of if the input tree is high degree, we'll just add in some some new edges to lower the degree. So we make sure that everything is low degree here. Okay, and so once you have this clustering, you can encode the clustering as a tree. Each internal node here represents like a cluster, a composite cluster, and each leaf node represents a singleton cluster. So this would be like a single cluster containing just the edge, AB. And then this cluster A contains both the vertex A and the edge AB. So that's that dark gray one right there and so on and so forth. So the, the children of a cluster node and the tree would be the constituent clusters that form together to give you that bigger cluster. Okay. So now into the, into the fun stuff. So like I said before, our goal is to design a framework that allows us to uh, evaluate mixed batches of updates and queries on trees. Like I said, for example, we can do path weight updates and queries, subtree weight updates and queries, uh, as well as as well as other interesting kinds of examples that we'll see in a moment. And our goal is to take this sequence offline, so we know the sequence of operations in advance, and just evaluate them all at once, very fast in parallel. Uh, you know, getting the answers as if we'd evaluated them sequentially but much faster. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of ways to solve this sequentially. You can just do the operations, throw them in a link cut tree or a top tree or an Euler to a tree or you know, your favorite dynamic tree data structure. Um, our goal is to look at doing this in parallel. Yeah. So I, I think that the key idea is that the operations that we want to adapt to. So in other words, you say query this path and assign the result to this end. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. The, 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 batch of up, the batch of operations is given to you in full ahead of time. So uh, it, it's, not, it's not an online problem. So you can't you know, choose your next query based on the answer to the previous query. So that means so that- The result will be based on the updates. To yes, the results will be based on the previous update. So it's all consistent with a sequential execution. But it is known in advance, right? The the exact queries and updates are known in advance. So query this vertex, update this edge, update this path, all known in advance. Okay, so uh, as I said, we're trying to sort of do this for many possible operations, not just trying to implement a solution just for you know, say path updates and queries, but we want to be able to solve many different kinds of queries and updates. So we define a, uh, I guess, a, a way of restricting what kinds of queries and updates are applicable and valid. And we call those simple operation sets. So we say they have a simple RC implementation. So to be applicable in our framework, we require that the uh, updates and queries, first they use an RC tree, that's important. And they do it by maintaining some value at every cluster of the tree such that the value of a non-leaf cluster is determined by some function of its child clusters. And that function should be computable in constant time. And, and like we said, this thing has constant degree, so that's not like an unrealistic restriction. Um, and we require query operations to essentially involve traversing, starting from some leaf cluster, and then walking up to the parent clusters that contain it, looking at their values, and possibly looking at the, the children of the values on that path. So looking at your siblings as you go up. 
So in other words, a query isn't allowed to go all over the tree and look at everything, right? A query is only allowed to look at this root to leaf path in the clustering. Um, and updates are similar. An update involves modifying a leaf and then just propagating the, the value update from you know, dot point one where the value of any cluster is computed from the value of its children. So again, an update isn't allowed to walk around and update things all over the place. It's only allowed to update a leaf and propagate that upwards. This might seem you know, a tad contrived, but it turns out that this sort of uh, flavor of operation covers pretty much all the standard common stuff like path weight updates and queries, subtree weight updates and queries. It covers like all the standard stuff um, that you'd be used to seeing on dynamic trees. So this is, turns out to be general enough that we can solve all the stuff that we want, um, but also specific enough that we can do it fast. Can I ask a question about the, yeah. the degree again? Um, mm -hmm. It seemed like that you had the demo tree was four, it was four at least, I saw. Uh, I, let's see. Yeah. I think it's degree three. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see. So you're looking at the, I see. The original tree is like degree three. Oh, I see. Okay. So you converted it. And then adding extra nodes to make it degree three, degree five. Yeah. So the, like the input tree could have been whatever. The, the input tree ends up being degree three. The Clustering, I guess, can have slightly higher degree, but it'll still be constant. Yeah, like the clustering here will still be a uh, constant degree. Like it might be like four, yeah. yeah. It might be like one more. <laughs> yeah, because the idea is that you can, if you have degree three, you can be adjacent to three clusters and then yourself, basically. So you can have degree one more in the clustering, but still constant. Okay. So uh, our results on, on this problem, we show that given uh, an RC tree on invertices and a batch of K operations from one of these so-called simple operation sets, then we can evaluate the batch in K log N work and just log N log K depth. So this should sound pretty good because if you were to just do this stuff sequentially, like you throw it at a link cut tree, you'd be spending log N per operation. And so K log N work is work efficient, right? This is like as good as throwing it in a link path tree and just evaluating everything one by one. But of course we get it in just log N log K depth, which is way better than doing everything sequentially, which would be like K log N, uh, K log N, well, be the same as the work. <laughs> so this improves on, on results from Geisman and Gianni Nazi. So from their paper where they improved Targa's parallel algorithm, they did something similar. Uh, except their framework could only solve like path weight operations instead of very general operations. And theirs was not work efficient. Theirs took an extra log factor. So we both speed up compared to theirs and we support a much wider range of operations compared to them. So uh, how do we do it? Well, the idea turns out to be, to be fairly simple. So we group the operations in the batch by their leaf. So remember that from the description, every operation has some associated leaf. If it's an update, it updates the value on a leaf. Uh, and if it's a query, it starts at a leaf and goes up. So every operation sort of has a, an associated leaf that uh, is important to it. This might be like a vertex or an edge in the original graph. Uh, and we can then like prefix some on the updates. So we know what the sequence of values will be on that vertex. So if, you know, if you're doing some weight problem and there's a plus five and a plus two and a plus three, you know, you'll have five, seven. That's so easy. That's just to prefix some. And then the fun part is you go through the tree and you merge things up. So if you have two children and you merge upwards, you'll essentially absorb each other's like updates and queries. You have to merge them because you need to keep the like the relative times intact. So was that, did you have a question? Merged by what? Yeah, merged by timestamp. Yeah. So you each like the operations in the input batch, right, are in some order. So you remember that order and you make sure you merge them to keep them in their original order. And uh, well, this makes a lot more sense if I give you a diagram. So 
We start with our input operations, right? So maybe this is some sort of update that adds two, some kind of update that adds three, some sort of query here, which I'll denote by Q. So that's our input operations. We, uh, we prefix sum them. So our value of two, two plus three is five. And that gives us what we call the operation list at that cluster. We can then look at the neighboring clusters, whatever they may be. Um, each of them comes with some, you know, timestamp here. And then we can merge them together. So this will give us, you know, a sequence uh, of values and queries based on merging all of the timestamps that we saw in the children. And the values that we compute require us to basically to use this, this timestamping to use the most recent value based on the current timestamp. So say up in uh, this higher one here, if I have timestamp seven, we basically find the most recent value in each of the children. So seven in the left, six in the middle one, that's the most recent to seven, and one in the rightmost child, because that's the most recent to seven. And in this case, you know, we're adding the values together. Of course, how you combine them depends on your, depends on your operation for how your uh, operation combines values. In this case, as an example, I'm just adding them. And you know, queries work similarly, because remember, we said that a query in a simple operation set has to involve starting the leaf and walking up. Well, that just means the query can evaluate itself as you go, right? It can walk up with you as you do this merge, and it has access to everything it needs. It can see the values as you generate them. So as long as you keep your queries uh, merged in sorted order, like we have here, they can look for the most recent values nice and easily. Okay. So you do the prefix sum like at the very beginning on each leaf. And then as you go up, you do parallel mergers, basically. You only need the prefix sum at the leaves because once, you, once you've got your sort of sequence of, of no, leaf values. Here, here, here. That's, the oh, that's just a sum though, isn't it? It's not a prefix sum, that's just a sum as an example, like your, your value, right, can be anything that fits in this simple operation framework. So it's, it's any function of your children. It's any arbitrary function of your children that you want. In this, in this case, an example I've used, you know, I want the sum of my children, but you could take the max for some different operation. That, that, that is any arbitrary. So the, the, leaf, the leaf operations have to be associative. Well, so you remember your, your, the number of children you have is constant, right? It's constant degree. So the way you get the value at each internal node at some time, it's just some constant time function of the values of your children. Um, I believe the associative function was only for doing an update on the leaves. Well, okay, so then uh, I'm also because if it's not, if the queries don't have to be associative, then. I mean, it probably, they probably would end up being associative. I mean, it has to just be something that makes sense. So. Right, but, but I guess the point is that you're, you're free to define that operation for combining however you want. <clears throat> so you should probably define it in a way that makes it consistent and work. Okay. But the, the RC tree does have a predictable structure. Okay, so potentially you're like, well, I'm going to use this structure RC tree in my definition. Exactly, yeah. So your, your query may in fact need to, like, may, may need to lean heavily on the structure of the RC tree. Like it knows, for example, the difference between a cluster that is like below another and one above another. And it might care more about the higher one in some way. Okay. So now that we have our, our batched mixed operations, how do we apply these to min cut? Well, as a, as a fun warm up, there's a very simple, uh, easy way we can actually get two improvements very quickly. Um, first of all, we can look at Geisman and Gianni Nazi's algorithm. Like I said, the sort of crux of their whole algorithm was doing something similar to what we just did by batching up a bunch of sequential dynamic tree operations, but theirs was a log n factor slower than ours. 
<coughs> well, we can just plug our algorithm into theirs and immediately speed theirs up by a log factor. So we get a nice uh, m log cubed n work uh, algorithm, uh, parallel algorithm. And another very easy speed up we can get is we can look at a recent sequential algorithm by uh, Lovett and Sandland. So this algorithm is actually the same work as Karga's algorithm, Karga's m log cubed m1, but it's like a thousand times simpler. It's, it's, just a, it's just a quick sequence of dynamic tree operations. And uh, well, hey, a quick sequence of dynamic tree operations, we can just throw into our batch processing dynamic tree operations framework and basically turn their m log cubed n sequential algorithm into an m log cubed n work parallel algorithm. So this is sort of like two quick and easy results that improve uh, prior work. Uh, but of course, we still have to match um, the m log squared n algorithm. But this is like a fun warm up. Yes. Maybe I missed this word. You have to bound the height of the cluster. It will be at most log n. Oh. It will always be at most log n. Yeah. By the way that it's constructed. Yeah, I, 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 should, I probably should have mentioned that. Yes, it, it definitely will be short. It'll be like order log n. Is that a question? I'm missing a big picture. Um, you're not going to ever go in there, but it's like <laughs> how does this connect to the? Are you going to get back to connecting this to the tree tree truck thing? Yes. Talk about the beginning. Yes, that's probably ninety percent of the rest of the talk. We're almost there. We had to we had to build this tool first, okay. and we're going to throw this tool at the two respecting cuts. And and make it work. So yes, that's uh, coming up soon. Or so the very first thing we need for Karga's algorithm that I'll go over briefly. Um, so Karga's algorithm is, is kind of interesting. It needs a bit of bootstrapping. The very first step of Karga's algorithm is uh, sampling the graph to to sparsify it a bit or to make it to make it smaller. Um, and in particular, the sampling probability is supposed to be proportional to the size of the minimum cut. But we're trying to compute the minimum cut. So the way we do that is, well, the sampling probability is allowed to be you know, a constant factor off. So an approximate minimum cut is good enough. So the first step of Karga's algorithm for computing a minimum cut is to compute an approximate minimum cut. Uh, and I won't go into the full details, but funnily enough, the first step of computing that approximate minimum cut is to compute an even worse approximate minimum cut. And then you make it slightly better, and then you get the exact minimum cut. So it's many layers of bootstrapping minimum cuts on top of each other. So we need a fast approximate minimum cut algorithm. So in particular, we will uh, we'll base our idea off uh, yet again, who'd have thought, another algorithm of Karga that's based on his contraction algorithm. Now, he showed that the contraction algorithm isn't just useful for exact minimum cuts with high probability. It's also quite good for getting approximate minimum cuts. Uh, in particular, he showed a way of getting a K approximate minimum cut by essentially doing the contractions and keeping track of the component with the minimum incident weight at any point. Because note that during the contraction algorithm, the weighted degree of a component that's being contracted, that's a potential cut, because you can just take that component and isolate it from everything else. Like, so that's one potential cut. So if you keep track of all of these, you'll get a pretty decent approximation. And uh, sequentially, right? we just simulate the contraction process and we look at the degree at each step. But how do we, how do we parallelize this? It's not so clear. Well, let's see if we can rewrite it in terms of dynamic tree operations. So suppose you have a dynamic tree that supports these operations. You have weighted vertices, and you can do subtract weight. So you can take weight off a vertex. You can do an operation called join edge, which basically labels two edges as being like joined together in the same component. And then a query, which ret returns you the total weight of the vertices that are joined to the given vertex, right? So you can think of this as being like an incremental connectivity and keeping track of weights on the vertices. Uh, we show that you can implement this using a simple operation set on RC trees. So by the definition I had before, you can implement these exact updates and queries using simple operations. Therefore, we can do them in batch using our batch evaluation framework. Then all we have to do is observe that we can in fact simulate Karga's contraction process and keeping track of the weighted degree using these operations. So we have our graph. Uh, initially, we, we weight each vertex by its like weighted incident degree. 
right, the thing we're keeping track of. And now when the contraction process says, hey, I'd like to contract an edge, we look at the edges that essentially are currently in two different components, but are about to be smooshed into one component. This is easy to determine using a maximum spanning tree computation or a maximum weight uh, edge on a path. Because you can imagine that if I have you know, an edge, it connects two vertices. There's some path between them in the tree. Those edges in the tree are going to get contracted in some, in some order. And the one that contracts last on that path will be the one that smooshes them together. So that's just a heaviest weight edge on a tree query, which is like a standard dynamic tree problem. We don't even need our fancy framework for that. So we can identify these edges that will be smooshed together. Since they're being smooshed together, they no longer contribute incident weight to the vertex because they're now no longer connecting to a different component. They're just internal. So we can subtract the weights from those endpoints and do a new query on those vertices. Say, hey, what's your new incident weight? Keep track of that answer and just take the best one overall. And well, of course, we also do the, this join operation to then join these components together so that our query gives us the, the right answer. So this process uh, essentially gives you your, uh, the, the answer to the contraction process of Kaga that says, contract the edges, keep track of the minimum incident weight. And like I said, this is nothing but some big sequence of dynamic tree operations. So hey, let's just throw it into our algorithm that evaluates dynamic tree operations fast and in parallel, and we'll get our approximation algorithm fast and in parallel. So this is, this is basically the first step of Karga's algorithm, right? We get our approximate minimum cut C. That's used to sample the edges of the graph with probability log n on C. This is done because you want to reduce the minimum cut in the sampled graph to be roughly sized log n. Right? And this is because the subsequent algorithms Karga runs to generate his spanning trees have runtime proportional to the size of the minimum cut. So if the cut is big, that's bad. So you first have to sample it down to get sort of a representative of the cut. And, and Karga does the maths and shows that if you do this, um, even if you do this sampling, you still get the, the nice property that one of these trees two constrains your cut with high probability, even once you've sort of sampled out most of it. Uh, and this, this step is, is easy to parallelize. It's just a bunch of MST computations and there exist you know, good parallel algorithms for MSTs. So this step, uh, this step isn't, isn't too complicated. There's nothing new here besides the approximation. Okay, so now, now we get into the fun stuff that uh, people have been asking about. So how do we solve these two respecting cut problems? Well, Karga's algorithm and all of the ones that are based on it, they tend to work by splitting the problem into two cases. Uh, one they call the descendant edges case, which means the two edges we're gonna pick from our tree to constrain our cut. Uh, like one is the ancestor of the other, so they lie on some common root to leaf path. And then they are not on the same root to leaf path. So they exist on like two sides of, of some you know, common lowest common ancestor. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, arbitrarily. Yeah. Any root will do because, like, if you pick an arbitrary root and solve both these cases, that's all possibilities, right? I mean, you're either on the same root path or you're not. So, arbit pick an arbitrary root and and solve both of these cases, and you will have solved the whole problem. Okay. So, there's a very useful fact that will help us in designing these algorithms. Um, if we pick two edges, E and E prime, what will the weight of the cut be that actually is constrained by those edges? Turns out it's given by this formula, which, uh, well, is much easier to see why if I show you a diagram. So let's not stare at the formula too long. Let's look at a diagram. Uh, these are the two cases, the descendant case and the independent case. And all this formula is telling us is, well, if I pick these two edges to define my cut, then a non-tree edge, right, an edge that didn't end up in the spanning tree, it crosses the cut if it crosses over one of the edges, but not both of them. If you go from here to here, you're in the cut, right? You go here to here, you cross the cut. If you go from here to here, well, then you must have crossed two cut edges. And of course, if you cross two cut edges, it meant you went back where you came from. So the edges we care about are those that cross E or cross E prime, but do not cross both, because you just went back and 
precisely why we have this symmetric difference up here. Fe means the set of edges, uh, like the set of non-tree edges or tree edges that cross the tree edge E. So you either cross one or the other, but not both, and hence the symmetric difference up there. Uh, does that make sense? All right, you cross the cut if you cross one of the edges, but not if you cross both, because it means you just went back to the side of the cut you were already on. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we we will e we will cover the one edge case sort of for free, pretending there's like a phantom edge at the top of the tree, and pretending that's one of them, and then you find another one. So that sort of easily gets uh, factored in for free, but that's a it's a good point. Yes. Okay, so how do we do the descendant edges case? Well, let's imagine that we fix one tree edge E, and now our goal is to seek some descendant of E, some, some edge underneath it, and pick that as, as its partner. That means we want to minimize this expression here, right? This is the expression from the previous slide. So we want to pick the minimum E prime such that uh, you know, we get the best two constraining cut from picking this fixed edge E. Well, let's uh, let's use dynamic trees. So let's maintain a weighted dynamic tree where on each edge E prime, the weight of this edge is exactly this formula, right? Let's rig the tree to have this weight on the edges. And therefore to find the best one will just be a minimum edge weight query. It does. So we're gonna have to figure out how to update it. So initially each, each weight is just uh, W of F of E prime. This is sort of like what Anupam was asking about. You can imagine that at the beginning, you're looking at no edge. This is like the one, the one cutting edge case. Um, so you know, we can pre-compute those weights. That's easily easy enough. So yeah, the hard part, like Danny alluded to, is this is if we fix an edge E, how do we, we want to do all of the edges E. We clearly don't want to build a new tree every time, so that'll be too slow. So how does this quantity change as we move through the tree? That's what we have to ask. So say we're on this bold edge here and we traverse the tree and we move to this edge. The question is, well, well how, how does this formula change? Well, the left, the left term is the same. I mean, it's just the contribution on each edge E prime. What changes is this intersection. So all that matters is, does the edge we're looking on intersect a new path that it didn't before? That's all that matters. So if we have some path like this, then our edge E has gone from not intersecting this path to intersecting this path. So a new term, will appear in this, in this intersection here. So all we have to do is compute for each path what we call the top edges. These are just like the topmost edges of this path, like the turning point, because that is when this traversal will hit this path and that path will start mattering in this formula here. So all we need to do is pre-compute these top edges. That's, that's easy, that's just a lowest common ancestor calculation. So we compute the lowest common ancestor for each, uh, each edge UV here. We look at the top edges on the path and we just remember, we write down, hey, when you hit this edge, make this path relevant. Make this path relevant just means do a, uh, an update to your dynamic tree to add the weight on this path. So we're just gonna do an add weight between U and V of the weight of this guy, or I think, I guess, minus two times the weight because we want this formula to be right. But that's the thing. All that matters is the the top edges. That's the only thing that changes that intersection. Yes. Ah uh, no. So this this is like got nothing to do with the clustering yet. This is this just means highest with respect to the original tree. Yeah. Oh, like closest to the root. Yeah, exactly. Just closest to the root. It's it's just the edges underneath your LCA, which there's either two of, or there might just be one of if U and V are like descendants of each other. Um, I see. In that case, it will have never mattered in the first place because it will have only added weight on that path. If we're now here, that never added anything to this edge in the tree. But it, it added before. But that's okay, It because it added to like here and, and everything above it. Because the point is you add your contribution to the edges on your path only, right? Like you add your contribution to the edges on the path between U and V. Your contribution was never on this edge. So 
it was never in the in the formula. So, so I think the what I think is what I'm also using is what so earlier when we were on the parent stage, we were counting the contribution. Yes, but we were counting that guy's contribution because he had added his contribution to that edge when he did an add weight from you know my two endpoints. So his contribution was his contribution was sitting on this edge. It, it was never on this edge at any point. So right at the beginning, I could imagine that every cross edge had its contribution to all the partners I just Yeah, so that, that was the first step, right? We computed this weight. We, we computed this weight for each edge UV. You looked at the UV path and it just added its weight onto there. So those weights were already there. But the weight of something that goes like this, well, it simply was never here to begin with. So we don't need to get rid of it because we, we didn't even have it there. Exactly. That's the only part that changes. Because that this first part will just be the same. This is the only part, as you change E, this is the part that changes. So that's all we have to worry about. So this is all in the world of the original tools. Yes. This has to be mapped over to operations on the dynamic region. Yes, so that's that's what we're about to look at. Um, I mean, that, that mapping, I guess, is, is quite simple. Notice that all we ever said we had to do here was the only operations we ever did was subtracting weight on a path, right? So subtracting weight on a path in a tree, that's something we can do with a simple RC implementation. And, and then, of course, when we visit uh, when we visit an edge, we query for all of its descendants. So we want to find the best like partner edge. So all this algorithm is, it boils down to a sequence of subtree minimum edge weight queries and add weight to a path. Yeah. Traverse the edges. Like, yes, yeah, so exactly. You should traverse the edges like so that they're adjacent. So an Euler tour is like the easy way to do that. And then we're going to add this weight back to the point of the edge. Exactly. Yeah. When you go back up, you just invert. So you, you subtracted weight. If you go back up, you add it back. Exactly. You just invert whatever you did. So this whole thing just boils down to a big sequence of uh, subtree weight queries and path weight updates. So we can generate that sequence, throw it in the blender of uh, evaluate those operations offline, and out will pop the answer to this. Essentially, we'll be simulating that sequential process all in parallel. So this slide just summarizes what we've been talking about. Okay, so finally, what about the independent edges case? So remember, this is the case now where the two edges are not uh, descendant or ancestor of the other, but they are in two different subtrees of some lowest common ancestor. So again, let's look at this formula. It's very handy. Uh, the first two terms are like are easy, right? They, they're just the total weight of the edges that, that cross these edges. How do we handle this intersection term? Well, we're just, again, we're just looking at edges. This intersection is edges that cross both edges of the cut, right? Those are the ones we don't want to count. If you're up here, you never crossed either edge, that's okay. If you cross here to here, that's good. We count that. If you cross here to here, that's good. The only things we don't want to count accidentally are the things that went from here and over here. They crossed both edges, which means they are just the edges that go from green to green. Right, they're the edges underneath E and underneath E prime. Those are the edges that we have to subtract off two times their weight. And then we'll be good. Right, these guys down here, right, they're like the only ones that are that, uh, sort of non-trivial to handle. Okay, so Garachowski et al. had uh, a handy framework of like breaking this down. Essentially, you can take this problem and break it up by the lowest common ancestors, right? Because remember, let's so maybe have a look at the diagram again. All that mattered here, right, was we, we fixed some two edges. They have some lowest common ancestor and the edges that can cross from underneath one to underneath the other also have that lowest common ancestor in common. So we can partition the problem up based on LCAs, right? So we can take all of our non-tree edges and just group them into buckets by who is your LCA. Then for each LCA, we will then ask the question, okay, I need to pick one edge to the left of this LCA, one edge to the right, and I wanna minimize the sum of their costs 
minus two times the sum of the all the edges that were underneath those two. Okay. And uh, this sounds kind of expensive, right? Because there could be like n LCAs. That sounds like we're making like n whole copies of our tree. Sounds like we've already done too much work. We notice that all that matters in the tree are like the endpoints of the non-tree edges. If there's a whole bunch of vertices that aren't anywhere near a non-tree edge, we can compress those edges away. Essentially, this is the same trick that suffix trees do, right? If you have a whole bunch of vertices that don't actually need to be individual vertices, you compress the tree down. So we have a diagram of that here. So if you have, say, this edge here, V9 to V11 to V14, essentially V11 just gets sort of compressed out. These edges get merged together because they weren't adjacent to any of the pink vertices, which are the non-tree edges that cross from one side to the other. So once we partition up our edges, we can compress the trees down so that each tree, its size is going to be proportional to the number of non-tree edges. And the total number of non-tree edges is just M. So we've, we've sort of split this problem up into a bunch of small problems of total size M. So if we can solve each of them efficiently, we can just solve them all in parallel and the whole thing will be efficient. That's for a specific group. LCA. That's for a specific LCA. So we, we try we do this to every possible LCA. And that's why we have to compress, because if we don't compress, we could have n trees of size n, or it's already too bad. So that's why we need to split it up by LCA, but then make each, make sure each of those is a small problem. Or at least, you know, their total size is small. Maybe one of them is really big, but the total size is at most m. So we basically transform the problem into this, right? We start with our LCA, our non-tree edges, we compress it down to make it small. And then we ask, okay, we have our sort of two sides. We have to pick one edge from this side, one edge from this side. And we want to minimize the costs of the edges plus the, the costs of the edges underneath, where the, the ed edges underneath cost minus two times their path weight. Okay. And uh, so how do we do this? Well, I guess this is the part where we don't actually use our batch evaluation algorithm. We just throw it at RC trees directly. So the idea is we're going to use RC trees uh, to represent both halves of the problem. Remembering the halves are like the left subtree and the right subtree because we want to pick one edge from the left, one edge from the right. So we represent the left half as an RC tree and the right half as an RC tree. In particular, we want to rig this right RC tree so that the weights, right, the weights on the edges on the right-hand side they essentially correspond to the weight of the edges that are underneath the cluster we're currently looking at on the left. So on the left, we are going to, now we're going to use the RC tree and it's like pure form. We're going to look at the clustering from top down and we're going to dive recursively into the clusters, looking at smaller and smaller clusters. At each moment in that traversal, we want to know what are the weights of the edges underneath me? Because remember, those were the ones we had to do minus two of. So this RC tree on the right, he always knows about the edge weights of the edges that are underneath the cluster I'm currently looking at. And so therefore, this guy will recurse in when it hits a leaf cluster, i.e. just a single edge. This guy contains all the weights of the edges underneath them. And therefore, a minimum uh, weight query in this spam gives you your best like partner edge for that edge. Okay. So hopefully the broad idea makes sense there. So say, as an example, we're looking at this here. We, we're looking at this bolded cluster. We, we know currently the contribution of the edges underneath that cluster. And then say we recurse into this top subcluster, right? The subcluster of that bigger cluster. That means now we have to add in the contributions of the edges that are underneath that cluster that weren't before, which will be stuff from here, basically. And edge, edges that were in here previously weren't underneath this big cluster, but they are now underneath the smaller cluster. Is this why so their weights get added in. The the these, are, these are both RC trees being used in different ways. This is a little bit tricky. So this RC tree is being used for the clustering. We are looking at clusters and diving down recursively, starting from the whole tree then looking at smaller subclusters as we go down, eventually with the goal of hitting, you know, a singleton edge cluster. 
the right RC tree is being used for the purpose of maintaining edge weight sums, like path sums. So they're both RC trees being used for completely different purposes. One is being used for like a, a, a work efficient way of traversing like all the edges and by going through the clusters. That's the one on the left. And the one on the right is being used to maintain edge weights. So they're both RC trees just being used for different purposes. That's why it's a little bit funny, but that's the main idea, right? The one on the right is maintaining the sums, right? Of the edges that are below the current cluster. Right, and below you know the edges in this corresponding tree. So therefore, when the left guy hits a singleton cluster on the bottom edge, it knows if we hold this invariant that the right side has the weights of all the edges on the right um, and the contributions of the edges underneath. So it can just do a minimum edge weight query and it'll get the answer for its best partner, that edge. So we do this and we take the best one and we get the answer. And uh, final little detail again, if we, of course, we're going in parallel, we don't want to like concurrently edit that tree on the right. So we're gonna have to make a copy every time we recurse. We don't want to end up with a million copies that are huge, that'd be too big, but we do the compression trick again. Every time we recurse, we just compress that tree down so that it only contains the vertices that are relevant, which of course are the vertices adjacent to a non-tree edge in the left. As long as we do that, we will keep the size of the problem small. And so you throw all of that together. We have a solution for the independent edges case and the descendant edges case. Both take m log n worth and log squared n or log cubed n depth. We have the k approximate minimum cut, which we use to perform the sampling step. And you throw it all together and out comes an m log squared n worth polylog depth minimum cut algorithm. So that's it. And in conclusion, we solved our, uh, our batched operations problem by designing this framework for solving simple operation sets where we essentially simulate a bunch of sequential updates on a dynamic tree all at once in parallel. This allowed us to parallelize and speed up uh, the problem of the minimum cut approximation <laughs> that we needed for the first step of Karga's algorithm and the descendant edges case of the two respecting cut algorithm. And finally, we show that we can use RC trees to help us solve the uh, independent edges problem uh, for the two respecting cut problem. So all in all, like, with, you know, the, the game isn't over for minimum cut. There could still be a faster algorithm. There's no reason to assume m log squared n is a lower bound. But for the first time, we now have a matching parallel algorithm that's just as far as the algorithm. So if you do come up with a faster parallel algorithm, that will give us a faster sequential algorithm too. And uh, there we are. Any more questions? We're right on time, I guess. I guess we had a ton of questions in the middle, so maybe there's none left at the end. <laughs> yes. Um, so on the previous slide, it looks like. Um, How previous? This one? The, yeah, the only step that actually requires the unlock square is the first step. Ah, I see. Yeah. So. Note that we're solving the uh, two respecting cut problem in n log n, but we have to solve that log n times because Karga's algorithm says, I'm going to give you log n trees, and one of them two constrains the minimum cut, but you don't know which one. I, I guess what I'm is, are each of these three steps? <clears throat> um, yes, at least for our work. Like uh, in, in our work, we don't have any slack in each of these, so we had to improve every one of these steps. Okay. And so now these are, each of these are matching the best sequential algorithm? Or... Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. There, I mean, there are special cases where you can do faster, like for dense graphs, you can do faster, but this is sort of like as good as it gets in complete generality. Okay. What is K of the approximation? Ah, so the K, so, well, basically, Karga gives a K approximation and he says, look, if you, if you do the contraction process, some function of k times, you'll get a k approximation. It works for any k you want. In, in our specific case, we used it for it to get a log n approximation. I didn't go into the details there, because it's a lot of copious details, but we used it to get a log n approximation because basically the work is that you can 
it's uh you can get an m n to the two over k log n work k approximation so i didn't go into the details there but this is basically what you get this is not really good enough to get a constant approximation because you'd need to set like k is constant and then this would be like m n log n and that's too much work the best that this is uh as useful for us is as a log n approximation then this is m log n work so we use this this is the bootstrapping i was talking about we use this to get a log n approximation and from the log n approximation we get a constant factor approximation um, and then we use the constant factor approximation for the sampling yeah so i i sort of omitted those details due to due to timing um how many times do you do this so you, you do this log n approximation once at the beginning and you use that like log n approximation as a seed for a binary search and that's how you find the constant factor approximation because you have a log n approximation so now you you only have to try like log log n things before you hit a constant approximation and and there is a method you can use to like verify whether you hit a constant approximation you basically you binary search you guess all right is this a constant approximation you do the the sampling skeleton step where you just sample with probability log n divided by your guess of the min cut and then if the minimum cut of this sampled graph is log n size log n it means you guessed right if it's too small it means you didn't guess enough so that's like the bootstrapping step i talked about where you sort of to get a log n approximation you then start guessing constant approximations until you get it right and use the constant approximation to sample and do the exact algorithm so there's a lot of nitty-gritty details in in that that i didn't cover yeah so i believe the first step is a randomized step and then all the later steps are deterministic that's a good question yeah that's a good point so yeah the first step in Karga's algorithm is the only one that requires randomization because you, you sample these trees and with high probability one of them two constrains them in cut but you can solve the two respecting cut problem deterministically um very recently um jason uh came up with a way to de-randomize that uh that first step uh jason yeah jason lee so he showed you can de-randomize that first step uh although it's the bound it's it's not you know as it's not as tight you get like basically an m to the one plus epsilon so it's like slightly worse than m like polylog n but very close but that does make the whole thing deterministic and this is like the best known way to solve the problem deterministically um i i i am not convinced you can do the that de-randomized part in parallel although i haven't tried the details but it doesn't look like it i mean i'll, I'll check one day but it it seems hard it's certainly not trivial to parallelize like if it is parallelizable it's a whole another paper <laughs> Cool. So, um, you used uh, the uh, RC trees, mm -hmm. um, but there are other, there are other <laughs> dynamic trees like wind gut trees and topology trees, right? Yep. Or or uh, other core trees. Mm -hmm. um, was that the, the only one of those choices which which had somehow the features you needed to? Yeah. Yeah. So all this stuff. Yeah, so so the main I guess reason we choose it is because it, it has what we need. If you look at um, like link cut trees, they are hard to parallelize because their bounds are amortized. So if you get a really long chain, you kind of you kind of get screwed by trying to parallelize. Euler tour trees can be parallelized, but they don't support as wide a flavor of operations. Um, they they don't support the same broad class of operations that RC trees do. Top trees do support the wide range of operations that uh, RC trees are actually very similar to RC trees. Um, they support the same wide class of operations, but there's no known algorithm to construct them in parallel. So even though the tree itself, you could you could use it in parallel once you have it, but building it in the first place, uh, as far as we know right now, is sequential. It's it's not unlikely that they'd be parallelizable, but yeah, the, as as it stands right now, RC trees are the one dynamic tree that has all the properties we need which is satisfying like a broad range of queries not just a very limited set of queries and is completely parallelizable so yeah they're, they're the only one as of right now that does all the stuff we want
school, any, anything else. 